Hey, what is up guys? So today in how to make money in Yu-Gi-Oh, we're going to be talking about short-term and long-term money cards in Yu-Gi-Oh. Let me go ahead and give you a quick little example right now that we can use in the real world, whether you are a uh, vendor yourself or just one of those players that likes to just trade cards because certain cards are worth more than others. And that definitely does change as the uh, meta changes and as the formats change. So let's go ahead and give you an example that you can actually use right now if you are a uh, vendor or if you're just like a player. Uh, so let's go ahead and give you an example. So as of right now, uh, Ultimate Rare Ally of Justice Catastrophe and the Shadal Nephilim or the uh, Shadal Construct is about the same price. They're running anywhere from 10 to 15 bucks, you know, in between that area. Now, uh, the Construct or the Shadal card here will be only conditional basically to one archetype, meaning that this will basically only see play in Shadals. I know you can run Super Poly and there might be another deck that can make use of this, but for the most part, guys, Shadals won't be around forever. That's just kind of how Yu Gi Oh is. A deck is not going to stay dominant for 40 formats. I mean, sometimes it'll stay dominant for a few formats like dragons have basically proved themselves that they can uh, save for multiple formats. Now sometimes decks do do that but more than likely they're not going to be uh, able to hold their value for a very long time. Now on the other hand a card like Allied Justice Catastrophe in the ultimate rare form it'll definitely hold its value over the long term course of the game uh, more than the uh, you know one archetype card. Now we can take this example and actually um, go more in depth into this analogy. Now certain things are actually going to hold their value much more even if they're technically supposed to be for one archetype. Now, for example, we'll take the uh, Dante from the uh, the Burning Abyss archetype. Now right now he's holding a, a pretty solid 50 bucks right now and he's basically required to play the deck. Also another thing you can take into consideration is how many copies of that certain card would you want to actually use in the deck. Like w when people are going to tournaments, are they winning with just one? Are they playing two? Are they playing three? Like for example, like Reborn Tengu, there's no way you'd play one or two Reborn Tengu. You play three, you know what I mean? So sometimes that can take into consideration uh, how expensive a card can be. Like Kizom was very expensive, that was only super rare. Rarity has nothing to do with, uh, you know, actually how much the card is worth. I mean look at Vandy's Emptiness as of right now. But uh, for the most part, this is basically uh, seeing more play in Burning Abyss than really anything else. Now this card still definitely has utility in other decks, so in the future this card could still actually see some play. Now obviously reprints have to be taken into consideration also. So I'm going to give you guys this example right here where, uh, you know, you as a vendor, if you happen to have multiple copies, uh, this happens a lot more so with vendors rather than uh, just people that just collect cards and just like to trade for, uh, you know, other archetypes and if they want to build decks. This is more so on the vendor side. So let's say uh, we'll take Ultimate Rare Solemn Warning First Edition, for example. Now, this card is a pretty solid $40 card, uh, or even like an effect, but that's another like example of a really solid card that has already technically been reprinted, and uh, having the highest rarity of like the first print is always usually going to be worth more than like reprints and all the other stuff. Now, Dante, on the other hand, is 50 bucks, like I mentioned, and this is all at the time of making this video, so if you're watching this video uh, later down the line, you're like, this card is only $2 now. Yeah, you know, reprints happen, you know, obviously this card will hold its value more than 2 bucks, but just just to say for the sake of the um, example, um, yeah, this for right now, this is 50, this is 40. Now, if I, let's say I have like, you know, 20 copies of Dante over here, and someone else has a Solemn Warning, I can go ahead and actually be okay with trading uh, one Dante for like a Solemn Warning. If I don't have any in stock, maybe you can start listing them, or, you know, just having them in the shop, so if someone wants what they can trade their other cards for it. It just helps give a variety to your shop, whether you're, like I said, a vendor, or if you just have cards in your binder too, if you have like a larger collection, it just gives more of a variety to your uh, binder because this card more than likely guys will not stay at $50 uh, forever. You know, obviously if the deck gets more hype, if there's some more support for the Burning Abyss, this card can go to $150 real easy. I mean, look at that, where's that uh, card? I, I don't have one on hand, but uh, well, I got one on my shirt. The Tour Guide. If you guys remember Tour Guide, uh, at one point she was like, you like 30 bucks. No one wanted her. She was like, she was so cheap. And then eventually she just became more and more expensive. And then people started realizing how good the tour guide into Sangin, into Detach, into Search, uh, which obviously got changed later on in the game. But for the most part, guys, uh, I mean, this is just all as an example. Like uh, Dante, like I said, is technically worth more than this card, but you can still technically trade uh, your card that is worth um, more for a card that is worth less. But in the long term, you more than likely will be benefiting from it. But like I said, Dante he could be used in other things. So keep that in mind as well. It kind of goes back to the whole like uh, the, the argument on uh, you know a temporary card versus a long-term card. So try to trade your cards that are uh, temporary for other cards that are going to be long-term. And if you want to trade a card that is uh, you know like another short-term card 
uh, could be technically something like this, for example, uh, that can be used in other decks. Now, again, uh, cards that can be used in multiple different uh, decks can definitely be worth more than, you know, cards that can be only uh, used in one archetype. Now, this card over here, Artifact Sanctum, is basically used in one archetype. It's supposed to be. It's for the artifacts. But people have been splashing this in basically everything. And that's why the OCG, they got, you know, the artifact engine kind of hit. And, you know, that can definitely happen to the TCG. So this could be a, technically, it can be considered a short-term card, or you can consider it a long-term card. And that all depends on banlists. Banlists obviously affect things a lot. But there are some times where, uh, you know, a short-term card is still going to maintain its value because of its just rarity. Like, if you were a baller and you, you own one of these, man, this... I, I don't know if a lot of you guys know about this, but this card over here, Venomonaga, the DD of Poisonous Sakes, first ed, like, this card, I, I, it's just really hard to get. It's one of those cards where, for whatever reason, there's just not that many copies of. Like, Galen Duo is another one of those copies. It's just, there's not that many in circulation. People want it for collector purposes, or I don't know what reason, but man, this card is just expensive. So, just because the card doesn't see any play, I just want to briefly mention that. That's why I kind of I put this card to the side, because I want to talk about just because a card doesn't see any play does not mean that the card is worth nothing. Just keep that in mind as well. But the basic concept of this was the short-term and long-term, uh, you know, thing in Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, you can use, like, an Effect Veiler as an example, you know, for, like, a uh, Construct also, because Effect Veiler will be basically used throughout the course of this game more than likely, unless, of course, they make something better. Uh, an excellent example that that I can demonstrate real quick would be something like Seven Tools of the Bandit, like a uh, Ultra First Ed Seven Tools of the Bandit. Uh, it's probably not going to be worth anything, uh, you know, anymore, because Wiretap basically is a much better overall quality. I don't think we need to argue at all unless you're trying to like reduce your life points in some crazy deck But for the most part wiretap is just a much better card and uh, you know that definitely replaced uh, Seven tools of the bandit, but a card like effect Baylor will probably maintain its value like longer than say something like the uh, Contract obviously not like a, a super rare uh, Baylor maybe like an ultra or something like that Well, which is already worth more than this But uh, anyways, I just want to give you guys that concept uh, if you guys have any other thought processes on this I'd love to hear them uh, in the comment section below because uh, well, I, I used to be a vendor and and I'd love just to hear your thought process and all the other good stuff. But anyways, guys, uh, I know someone's going to ask if you, where, where to get this this sick shirt. But I have a link down below in the description box. It says girlfriend. And then on the bottom it says, yes, I have three. And it's got three of the hottest girls in the Yu-Gi-Oh! game. But uh, anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Asian Eyes White Dragon, signing out.